The Liberating Arts seeks to articulate the enduring relevance of a liberal arts education during a time of pandemic and protest. Through our online platform, we will host a series of conversations with writers, academics, institutional leaders, and public intellectuals about the nature of the liberal arts, their formational purpose, and their moral significance in a time of great cultural disruption. We hope to inspire viewers and listeners to learn more about the liberating effects of these arts on their own lives. To find out more, please visit www.theliberatingarts.org or find us on Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, or YouTube. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Karen Swallow Pryor, Research Professor of English and Christianity and Culture at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And joining me today is Sven Burkertz, whom I know as an author of a book that's become really important to me in the past uh, few years, The Gutenberg Elegies, and then uh, his later work, Changing the Subject, is also uh, a work that's influenced my own thinking and writing about reading and literature. Um, hello, Sven. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning, Karen. And yeah, what can I add about myself? I suppose several hats I wear. Um, you know, I taught, taught for many years, but now I'm... Uh, I mean, I taught writing, let's put it that way, not English so much. Um, and I've been editing a literary journal called Agni or Agni up at Boston University for the last 15 years. And I guess I started out uh, really as a book reviewer and that came off of a long decade of working in bookstores and really just being a kind of a book rat and realizing that I had all this stuff in my head from reading and I tried out some reviews to places and they seemed to go. <laughs> I mean, they seemed to connect and get published. And in that day and that time and things have changed, you know, one thing could lead to another very quickly. So, you know, you publish a few and suddenly someone else is on the line saying, you know, we have this new book coming so I did that a long time before um, Gutenberg came around. And that obviously is not, it was a connected in the sense that the more I read and wrote about what I read, the more I began thinking about reading itself. And that was sort of, that thinking was concurrent with a, what I see as enormous and totally decisive change in our culture, which was, it seems almost like the good old days, the first advent of the computer, you know, and we're talking about dial up and the whole business. I actually, um, and I've written about this before, so it's not completely fresh, but there was a decisive aha moment in my life in terms of these questions. And um, years and years ago, decades ago, I was, uh, Visiting my parents, I lived in Ann Arbor. I had finished school there and I uh, was working in a bookstore. And I went home and I took a walk in the old neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it's a walk that took me up kind of a tall hill where I thought I'd be, you know, looking at the moon and seeing what the sky was doing. But instead, I noticed, and it was really for the first time that it came together for me as a picture. I noticed that everywhere I looked, windows were blinking blue. Mm. And I suddenly realized, I mean, I knew, sure, I, you know, we all watch TV, but it was the first time I saw it as a um, huge collective phenomenon. And that got me thinking in general terms about um, the collective mind versus I guess the individual subjective self, which, you know, we'll talk about that, but that's a lot of what reading is for me. At that point, it's hard to think back to be that far on the other side of what has transpired in the 40 years since. Um, it just seems something coming over the horizon. It was new. People were starting to get computers and you know, it sort of took over the culture fairly rapidly, this whole idea of computerization and the future was now and here it was. And it has only really 
gone on from there. But what has happened is it's gone on at such an increasing rate of penetration, um, which I would say, you know, referring to our moment here in the culture is about, well, it's the COVID moment is also a sort of, uh, what do I want to call it? Kind of a, we're on a virtual cusp. We've been mm -hmm. practicing virtual for many years now in different ways, including like what we're doing now and learning to do a lot of shopping online, just everything. And now we have as a whole society been kind of marooned by COVID and we are really now beginning to, uh, I think not only exploit, but kind of take on the full possibilities of mm. um, virtual everything and social media and, mm. you know, education, distance learning. And this was my great fear when all this started was that we were going to somehow um, wear away the notion of individuality as a kind mm. of ideal, which I always thought was, you know, Emerson, self-reliance, you know, it's kind of almost a fundamental American trope, you know, the rugged individualist who, right. you know, tamed the wilderness and built the cities and all that. It's very different now. And I, you know, my fear was that that was going to happen. And I think it is happening um, rather depends on your position. For me, alarmingly, for other people, it's possibly very exciting and it opens a whole new way of thinking. So that's kind of the really broad context that my thinking happens inside of. Uh, so the key term, yeah, I mean, I believe that the, the point of it all is a kind of attaining a self individualized, um, you know, self-fulfillment, not in a selfish way, but in terms of realizing the whole range of private potential that is there. And the fear is that the nature of the interactions that uh, our technology now has accustomed us to is just kind of keeping us at a surface. And a lot of this has just remained latent um, I think we are, in a way, changing at how we operate and, you know, maybe in the long run changing as a species, you know, by degrees. So that's, that's where I start. No, that, that's, that's really helpful. I mean, before we um, began recording, when you and I were chatting, we were talking about Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, which anyone who kind of wants to, um, to, Dig, dig deeper into what we're talking about uh, might start there um, because what Postman talks about is is print culture and and sort of that big you know a sort of 500 year um, period of our culture defined by print which of course the individual is very much tied to a print culture and what you're talking about is this transition that I, I think you're exactly right. We are living through this hinge moment where we are becoming something very, very different, as dramatically different as, as print culture was. Wouldn't yeah. you? And one of the things that uh, brings this home to me, and at first it was kind of amusing, um, but now as you know, a few more years go by, there's a whole generation and maybe even two generations coming up that don't really understand what the analog world was like. You mention something or show them something and it's like, what? You know, my one of my children at a point where he should have known much better, um, came to me one day and said, dad, where do I put a stamp on an envelope? Like, it just, he hadn't dealt with, <clears throat> paper wow. mail and just had wow. yeah. no idea what you do with this little <laughs> sticky thing. And so, you know, as all that stuff kind of drifts away, it's supplanted by and somewhat taken over by the other way of doing things. Well, and that 
that leads into kind of the the thesis of your of your book more specifically about reading um, and how it forms uh, not just individuals but a culture. So can you talk a little bit about that? You know, again, how reading forms us versus how this post reading or post analog culture forms us. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, I mean, I use when I talk about reading, I tend to talk about think of it in the ways that I read, which is to say it's a more literary sort of reading. I mean, you could be reading a geology textbook as well, but that's a different mental capacity that's being called on there. Um, what I'm talking about, I suppose, is reading that is not just presenting material facts, whatever, but is its purpose is to engage the self of the reader. Um, I think when you go right to the very beginning of how we come to it and learn to read, it's, it's really basic, but I think it's a crucial thing, which is it requires two things in abundance. One is attentiveness, mm -hmm. you know, focus on whatever it is that you're looking at that's in front of you. And, you know, once you've mastered the code, which is to say, you know what the words mean. And that's a great moment in life, by the way, I can remember it when suddenly it went from being an army of ants marching across a page to suddenly words emerging that I began to see I was making sense of. It's like um, magic, it really is. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing, and there's, you know, paying attention and imagination, um, projective imagination. It doesn't just come easily and naturally. It goes along with paying of attention. And it is a kind of equivalent of a, um, a muscle. You know, it's not a physical muscle, but it's a, a mental muscle, I guess. And I think it's really interesting um, in our sort of cultural discussion of all this stuff, maybe I'm going to say 10 years ago, um, the writer Nicholas Carr came out with, a, it was a cover story, I think in the Atlantic first, right, it's right. called it's Google making us all stupid. <laughs> and it just began with a very candid personal admission where he said, you know, he's somebody who's been reading all his life and I think teaching or whatever. And he had been noticing increasingly that it was very hard for him at the end of the day to sit down with a book as he had always done and to actually stay with it and pay attention. And I, th I think it's more than just whatever activities of the day had tired him out. I think that it was reflective of, you know, the, the wiring was being changed and that became a big part of what he then researched the neuropsychology of reading and um, yeah. So, I mean, he had a great example. I know I'm going from side to side here, but there was actually um, an experiment carried out. And I think it was a long-term experiment with London cabbies. Do you know about this? Was that, I think that was in the shallows, was it? Yeah, it was yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. I think it's very indicative though, is that it's not only that you're changing the wiring in some um, just abstract metaphorical sense, but this study showed that over time, you know, cabbies who had formerly just had the whole grid of London in their minds and began using GPS, and they took measurements over, the, over time. And they actually saw physical um, changes in the brain. I mean, sort of shrinkage in that area that used to govern, you know, holding all this data. And now that was being, the data was now in a machine. It was no longer up here. And I think, you know, that might be a little exaggerated as an overall model, but I think it shows the power of these transactions and trade-offs that we make. Um, so, yeah, so. So it shows really that, I mean, 
because I, I, I experienced the same thing with this, this lack of uh, attentiveness and this difficult, you know, to sit down and read like I used to for so many years. It's not just my imagination, right? It, it is right. actually something physiologically happening. And that actually, so if you can transition brief, you know, kind of to your next book, changing the subject, this is really what you're talking about. You're in, in the Gutenberg elegies, you're talking about reading and what, how it forms us. And then the next step is, well, when we stop, reading and we enter this digital age, we actually become different kinds of subjects. And I'd love for you to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think what happens is not, I mean, it happens on so many levels at the same time. And one of the things that the online digital virtual culture, whatever we want to call it, um, has just by the nature of how it operates created in us a sort of an anxious what's next twitch whatever you're doing there's a something's coming it's about to you know pop up on your screen or come in as an email it's a constant expectation and it's one that keeps you at the surface or tends to keep you at the surface and um that's one of the things I think is the Nicholas Carr reading moment is that what's hard to regain is sitting there and having only one channel open, the channel of yourself and what you're reading and sort of inhabiting. It's very hard to fight off that reflex in the body and the brain of, you know, well, now what? Rather than turning 30 pages quietly. That's very hard to do now. And it used oh. to be candy. <laughs> I, spent, I feel so it, affirmed. It's, it's true. It is hard. It's so it hard. Is. So um, the question is, what is this doing on a large scale? And um, if you are a true uh, believer in the power and you know magic of reading and all that it's a negative effect but i'm aware that if you think from a different angle and if you accept that the requirements of living in the world are much changed then this new way is you know it's an adaptation and it makes sense to many people um and they say well you'll lose the ability to sit for hours and read but then somebody will ask that maybe was once a real attribute and a desired thing, but in the world now, why would you? You know, it, it's that shaping that happens. And uh, I, for one, don't like it. <laughs> I mean, I don't like the thought of myself succumbing, but I'm not going to pretend that I don't, you know, use my laptop and I mm -hmm. use my email. I don't do social media in the larger sense i have a um, instagram account because i like taking pictures and posting them but that's very simple it's just you take it you post it um and i tweet occasionally if i have a thought that seems funny or interesting or i read a quote that just knocks me out i will post that but that's sort of the limit of that engagement what i'm seeing though i'm you know is how hugely important it has become in so many different ways. Obviously we've been watching it in politics. <laughs> it has, uh, I mean, it's incalculable to think how much uh, online media has shaped our political life, our responses to things. It's created a 24 seven cycle mm -hmm. of everything. If you log off for an hour, you're gonna miss the fact that the attorney general was just fired or whatever, you know. Right. So you're always kind of hooked to that little tube. Talk about um, changing the subjects, right? Yeah. We are the subjects of this new kingdom. Yeah, and I think what it does, it's not, I mean, it is interactive in a broad social way. I think, and it's a distraction in that way, but I also think it removes It stands, well, it makes you feel you're doing something mm -hmm. often. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you actually are. <laughs> we don't want to discount those, but 
there's an awful lot of idle grazing. Um, busyness. Busyness. Mm -hmm. That's not really. It's not productive, but it creates all sorts of notions of social consensus. You know, people are liking and following and approving things or else going the other way and, you know, mm. disparaging in mass ways what somebody said and it gives the illusion of it's a proxy life according to the old standards mm -hmm. it gives the illusion because it's interactive there are people involved however at a distance um it begins to supplant a certain kind of social activity and that's sort of what i came in on too was how the arrival of covid um is really reinforcing absolutely every mm. tendency and virtual habit that we have. It's all been, you know, shopping online and right. streaming stuff and listening online and just, you know. And so you say, well, what's, what's the, you know, what's the world of 50 years from now? Right. I don't see this reversing. I see it getting more and more sophisticated and people learning to work within that and establish their own sort of virtual center and identity, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I sort of worry about what we've left behind, which is this planet kind of rolling around in space with trees and rocks and stuff. Um, and that's the amazing thing. And that was a big part of the nature of my thinking about this was just to not only look at what was happening in front of us and projecting forward, but looking back and realizing, you know, I mean, I am old enough, you know, to have had a grandmother who, you know, where she grew up, you know, horses and carriages were common. There was no notion of something like television, but I sat with her on a couch and watched the first, moon landing you know mm. and the amount that is traveled in those changes i mean they are we adapt we're incredibly adaptable you know right and it's by the same token it's incredibly easy for us to shed old things as we adapt and you know I'm just, I'm a nostalgist. I'm stuck a little bit in the uh, imagination of a different older world. And I'll go on to say um, that a lot of that imagination of an older world has been reinforced by reading because mm -hmm. most of what I right. have read in my life is about sort of various levels of a prior world whether it's you know 18th century or early 20th century whatever it's all imaginatively i'm projecting into you know the world of the book which is the world that we're not in anymore which is a weird thing too which i mean so so we can imagine as well how the subjects of this digital age will be formed in a similar way by digital media as you and I have been formed by books and that's actually makes it even scarier I think yeah right? well you um, had that question on the you know sheet of things to think about as you know what's the difference between having grown up essentially in a reading and book culture versus coming of age in a uh, pretty much virtual online thing like many of our kids almost can't avoid whether it's you know gaming or just whatever the options are so vastly increased and they're so tempting mm. in the moment you know because they're quick and they're flashy and they give result you get you know your little adrenaline fix and that is a conditioning thing and that's what we're talking about again I guess you can't just shut that off and then go read Tom Sawyer quietly in your room. Right. It has begun to neurally, you know, what fires together, wires together, I guess is that slogan and that it is creating 
you know, both possibly literally as with the um, cabbies, but, you know, I don't know. I guess it's a habit. It becomes a habit and it becomes entrenched and it's very hard to break addictive habits as I well know. Um, so, yeah. And we have, you know, it's not just the natural human habit forming um, elements that we're dealing with, but these are compounded by the way that these you know, things are built into these devices and um, systems yes. to increase the natural effect. So it's not just our own, it's, it's a completely different world. And I have to keep reminding myself of that when I feel the effects of the, the addiction and the adrenaline rush and, um, yeah. and think of, and, and contemplate opting out altogether, because I don't know how you do it. Um, and I'd love for you to talk about that, how you, uh, m- you know, approach digital media more moderately than some of us, including myself do. You talked about your Instagram and your Twitter. Yeah, um, yeah. How, how do you approach Those that? don't form a very big part of my day. Um, what occupies me digitally, especially again in the time of Corona, um, is, you know, uh, editing this literary journal um, and dealing with submissions, which are all coming in electronically. So I'm constantly looking at things on screen, which is, you know, it's not like gaming, but it's still, you're in front of this device. Um, one way for me to cleanse myself, it's, it's harder for me to, you know, log off and go read, say, than it is for me to log off and try to write my way into my thoughts, you know, keeping just, um, just kind of a running, not a casual log. I mean, it's a, I write my thoughts as if I'm writing an essay, but they're really just, especially in this time, you know, things are changing so radically. It's a kind of ongoing montage of my inner life, I suppose. Um, That very quickly and effectively takes me away from the um, world of, you know, flash concentration. I think it has to do with it's, it comes out of the language and just the fact of using language and also maybe the long, I mean, I've been writing for like 50 years. So it starts a reflex, which is different and I can move into it and, the world does fall away for that time, um, pretty much, you know. Can you talk a little bit more about, um, because you, 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 I, you talk about yourself as teaching writing and being a writer, and yet you spend so much time thinking and writing about reading. And this is, again, another um, quality I think that we are losing. I, I teach, I do teach a little bit of writing, and I teach a lot of students who want, who want to be writers, but who aren't readers. Right. Um, so can you talk more about that connection between Uh, reading and writing and its importance well yeah I mean you know one of the uh somebody's great quote but I think maybe it was Saul Bellow um a writer is a reader moved to emulation which I thought sort of so reading definitely came first I think it opened you know those channels inside that you know had to do with words um I think the thing about reading aside from, you know, when you were young or when I was young, I would, you know, I'd read for the the content, you know, I wanted the story. I wanted the action, you know, whether it was reading about Rascal or Long John Silver or whatever, you know. Um, But I think stepping back and thinking on it more reflectively, um, it's almost, doesn't matter what the particular subject was it was the recognition of the act of transformation Mm. that's never even right now i can think about it and get kind of a little thrill off of it which is the idea that you can really you can be looking at a page of print and it is just little strings of black marks and whatever you're doing with it is actually creating 
an imagined interior. I mean, it is doing something, you know. You could say that, well, that's happening if you're watching a movie too, but you're not doing the transformation. You're still getting the excitement of whatever the content is, but you're not making it. And I'd say that's kind of true across the board with social media of all sorts is that, you know, it may be interesting, it may give you something, but you're not exerting yourself upon it in any way. So it flows over you and doesn't leave a terribly deep mark in terms of- this is so powerful. Thank you. Yes. Wow. I, want to, I just need to stop and think about this for a minute, but I'll just have to listen to it later. I, yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, it's fun to uh, rev up that side of the, the thinking <laughs> mind. So can you, so I don't want to, I don't want to cut this part of the conversation off. So let's keep continuing on this idea of transformation and this mm -hmm. interior work. And, and can, let's talk about this with, in, in our teaching, um, you know, whether, you know, I, I, you're not, you know, I'm still teaching, you're not, but you're, you're, your role as an editor is kind of a role as a, as a teacher in, in editing yeah, the writers right. that you work with. And then even in sending your journal, the journal out, um, the people who read uh, what you produce. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's talk about that, how well, we can teach. Sure. And these I mean, things. I have done two categories of teaching. I said earlier that I taught writing, but there was quite a long period where I was teaching, you know, basic kind of expository writing where you assign certain things and you talk about them and you make them write about them. We've all done that. <laughs> all that. And then the second part, which was, you know, the more recent 20 years was working, you know, with, with writers, you know, in a MA, MFA program who you don't have to sell writing or literature to, which is a huge difference. Right. With the earlier group, um, it could sometimes be enormously frustrating and it took me a long time to sort of suss out what kind of texts worked and which ones didn't. Um, but then also how one worked with those texts in order to create the interest that is such a big part of also then reflecting on and writing about something. And my big discovery, and it seemed really odd when, it, when I came to it, and I couldn't make it a complete overall teaching method, but there's a certain way to teach close reading. And it would be in a way to turn it into a game. So you'd bring in, you know, a passage from whatever, Edgar Allan Poe or Walker Percy or Eudora, whatever, a passage of good intended writing, not an accidental page of writing. I think you'd start, you know, everyone would have it and you'd say, okay, you know, kind of, what do you notice? Everyone's just, oh. and then somebody will say, well, I see that, you know, they use the word red like three times in this paragraph. I said, yeah, well, you kind of work them into it as if there's a mystery to mm. be solved. Mm. And they begin to get the idea that writing is sort of created for a purpose and that purpose can be approached closely by way of looking at the language and honoring the idea that the craft of it matters and then you can, I mean, you can really get down to, you know, why does this short sentence work right here? I mean, what's it doing? And like, well, you've been doing it. And when you come to that sentence, it's wakes you up or something, you know, mm -hmm. but the idea is not so much to get them talking about the whole of some book they've all read, which is usually just a recipe for vagueness <laughs> of every sort, but you know, that's there in the background. That's maybe what you're working toward, but the actual getting them really close to something that's really good and creating a forum in which they're almost competing with each other to find something cool in there that somebody else hasn't noticed. That seemed to work. 
And I would have thought nothing could be more dull to a college student than close reading. I mean, you know, but in fact, if you didn't call it close reading, mm. it kind of worked. So well, and, and, and this, this models and exhibits what you've been talking about um, throughout our conversation is the attentiveness that's required. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the interior work. Um, and so it's, it's all connected in that way. It is. And just to drift slightly to the side, I know there's a word which I use fairly often, but it's a key concept in changing the subject to us along with attention. But it's the fact that when you attend to something that is well, almost, if you're really attending to anything, you move into a different time frame. You're not in clock time so much, so long as you're fully staring at, you know, the tree trunk or, you know, the painting or whatever, you are moving out of clock time and into something, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, duration time, mm -hmm. right? which is the actual time that as humans we live in. We don't live in clock time, really. We were not born to it. We acquired it. And this other, I think, and that's all art, I would say, that we mm -hmm. recognize comes out of that. An artist has to be creating out of that sensibility, whatever the subject is, in order to bring the necessary mm. weight to the work or whatever. So, so can yeah. you talk um, a little bit about just the humanities in general? I'm, I mean, you, we know it's a bad time for the humanities. It's almost always a bad time for the humanities. But, but what can we say about the importance of the humanities and hope for the humanities? Um, even in the digital age? I mean, are there some gifts that the digital age offers us or in, the, in encouraging this love for the humanities or is it all, is it all curses? I think it works the other way possibly. And I keep imagining, fantasizing that something, you know, we've been enthralled now by the possibilities of what can be done with ones and zeros and you know all that i feel like and this is possibly a very vain hope but it's that there will come a kind of return of the repressed that people will have one of those great turnarounds where they suddenly just want to go back to something and actually you know colleges might at some point actually offer greek again <laughs> or you know whatever, but a discipline that um, right now in this current climate can seem highly irrelevant. Like, why are you going to study 19th century art? You know, you want to be in a STEM program somewhere, you know. But I think, I have to believe, actually, um, that those values are there. I mean, there'll always be some people to keep them notionally alive right um the question is whether that can be enlarged you know and brought into the larger culture in a way that but this country you know it has such a terrible class prejudice against learning and art it's all seen as you know, highfalutin or whatever. I mean, there's that deep vein, you know, um, and it's visible now in political terms maybe too, but it's just, it's hard to imagine how we can, you know, bring something back unless you smuggle it in, you know, and sort of ways that that happens is, you know, really good popular musicals, for example. Mm -hmm. They actually seem to reach people and people say, oh, you should go see whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard. Yeah, it's harder to imagine that happening with books except for Harry Potter. <laughs> it's <laughs> the last time I felt that the culture was taken over mm -hmm. across the board by not only kids invested in this, but parents reading to their kids and thinking oh it's kind of fun mm. um 
And so, you know, you have a lot of cities do that, you know, read a book, pick a book. We're all going to read, you know, Sound and the Fury, not really, but, <laughs> you know, um, Old Man and the Sea or whatever. That's going to be our book. I don't know how those fare. I hear those initiatives from time to time that this is, mm-hmm. I guess, book clubs sort of serve. They integrate social and reading and socializing together in a way. Um, and you know, anecdotally over the course of the pandemic, there have been some reports of 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 people re- you know spending some time reading the classics and some of yeah. the some of the sales lists showed um the classics at the top. So that that was encouraging, yeah. but Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Uh, whether it lasts or not. I, I I think we have changed the subject as you <laughs> as you wrote and and there probably isn't um any real turning back. Um but the thing, you know, maybe this should be a, a closing spot. Um, and this, for me, holds true very much for writing. And this is something I talk about with my friends who, you know, write, our writers. And all of us inevitably, and who knows how often, but just experience the utter Gobi Desert, dry, nothing seems interesting, but... You write it and look stupid, you know, all that. Mm-hmm. And I always end up in those myself. And I always find there's one thing that brings me back. And that is just to relax and in some way remind myself that at root, it's a pleasure. Making a sentence is fun if you allow it to be. But you can get so dutiful and so whatever that writing becomes a chore, but underneath that language itself is pleasure. And I think that if reading at all levels is to survive, I think it will be sort of dependent on the pleasure principle almost more than the dutiful, you must have read these hundred books in order to whatever. Um, Yeah, it's just trying to, get back into that mind state right it's 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 a love and it's one that may need to be cultivated but it can be cultivated and that is what is you know that is our job to do in ourselves and and our i think job to do for the world too as much as we can i couldn't agree more well this was such a pleasure um especially for me personally, because I've just admired your work for so long. And I do want to really encourage anyone listening to check out your books, The Gutenberg Elegies and Changing the Subject. Uh, Is there any other work that you'd like to mention um, that listeners might look for? Well, I have, you know, a little bit of a book I'm fond of, but it's very different. And it's a book called The Other Walk. And it's basically, in a way, it was trying to recover that notion of pleasure after being a dutiful reviewer and culture scold for so long. And it's just short little pieces coming right out of domesticity, really. Every day I would just, and it's about attention, I guess. Mm. I would just wait until my eye settled on something in a legitimate way, not like just pick something, but it always seemed to happen for a while. And then I would write about that this odd little personal, you know, two or three pages each kind of, but uh, so that's a book. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I personally will be looking for that and I hope others will as well. Um, Well, again, thank you so much. And um, I look forward to, um, to encountering you perhaps on Twitter or perhaps on Instagram, um, but more so in the pages of your books. Well, thank you. And also whenever this ultimately drops or manifests, uh, if there's a link or something, let me know. I'd just like check out how it's coming through. Absolutely. I will do that. I I do spend far too much time on Twitter myself. Um, So (laughs) I will be sharing it and I will, we will definitely send it to you and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with it. Um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of followers who, um, who are interested in reading and wanting to read more and read better. And I think this is really going to help and serve them. So So what is your Twitter? 
it's uh, it's um at k s p r i o r at so k s prior k s p r i o r yeah yeah this is really going to serve um the people that i try to teach not only in the classroom but out in the twitterverse i consider twitter my classroom so <laughs> let's yeah i mean i do my share I'll, i will look for you out there <laughs> it, it it's it's really kind of a mess out there no obligation my my twitter oh, yeah. no, no, my, of course. My, my twitter feed is is yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, see if, I, I'm a Baptist, so what? What can I say? You know, it get it gets it gets crazy. <laughs> so, all right. Well, all this right. is very nice. Nice. It's very nice. Enjoy nice the rest morning. of your day, and yeah. um, say hello to New England for me. <laughs> oh, I will right now. Okay. <laughs> all Thanks right. Bye bye. Bye bye.